Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Lessons Learned. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Thomas Dunin, author, um, former representative for the North Carolina Writers Network, and a good friend. My name is Vincent Vesa. I'm an author, the founder of Hidden Treasure Novels, and the current representative for the Metro North chapter of the North Carolina Writers Network. Thomas is going to share with you today his seventh lesson in a series of lessons that uh, he's brought to our attention as a writer. And Thomas, I'd like to turn the stage over to you. Well, Vincent, thank you for the uh, invitation on this rainy day here in North Carolina. And thank you folks for joining me for a few minutes. I'm going to give you a few ideas on uh, the second short story that I've written. It's called Waiting Room Frenzy. Um, sort of a tough topic to handle, a hospital surgical waiting room, and turn it into a, a whimsical notion story. So with that said, let's, let's go to the, the first two paragraphs, or the first paragraph of the story, and let's lead into it like that. It's 4.45 a.m. The opening lines are, geez louise, who turned the lights on? Rebecca, where are you? Are you here? What the, the jabbers is going on? It can't be five o'clock, can it? Becky, will you answer me? I can't work alone. Where the fiddlesticks are you? Tobias yelled. Rebecca sat in silence in the surgical waiting room nook, hidden behind a six foot silk ficus tree, repositioned last night by a maintenance woman. Tobias, her identically sized brother, couldn't see her. She loved teasing him. I'm here, little fella. I'm straightening my space, Rebecca said. And that's how the story begins. Rebecca and, Tom and Tobias sort of going back and forth at one another. Uh, identically sized twins, and they're the folks who uh, are going to narrate the, the whimsical story for us. So, Waiting Room Frenzy. The, um, the setting that I picked is, uh, ju it just sort of happened. I had been the previous day uh, with the family uh, in a hospital waiting room, search of a waiting room for four hours, and it was only after I got home that I realized, you know what, I think there's a story in those four hours and in that room. Uh, so very early, early on, figured, well, okay, I'm going to have it narrated by uh, two siblings, Rebecca and Tobias. The, um, the waiting room that I describe is an actual hospital surgical waiting room in the great state of North Carolina. And if you get into the read, the first well, four, five, six, seven pages or longer, I get into a lot of detail describing the room. Because as the story evolves or unfolds, most of the elements in the room become props that the characters use to uh, sort of tell their farcical story. Um, I knew from the first word or from the first sentence how the story would end, which probably for most of us is, is pretty important. Um, knowing the beginning and knowing how it's end, you sort of hate to be in a position of spending four or five months writing a piece and still can't figure out how it's going to end. And you might have to trash the whole thing because it just doesn't come to you. There's, there's a, a logical conclusion to the story. I knew the exact ending. Um, I also knew that because I was dealing with uh, what's normally a, a very serious topic, uh, people waiting in a hospital room or surgical hospital, hospital room for their family or friends, I had to be so over the top with the, the characters and with the activity in the room that the reader would know from the very beginning, this guy's not serious, this is funny. Um, the story became very heavy on dialogue. It, it was very quick moving. And the characters, as you'll see on the next slide, are, are totally outrageous. And I also did something. I time-stamped the story by the minute. So it starts at, I think, 5.15 a.m., then it goes like to 5.42, then 5.47. And then after each time-stamp, we have a different element of the story. And that sort of uh, shadows any of us who would be sitting in a waiting room, sort of looking up the clock and waiting, or looking at our watches and waiting. And uh, I thought it was sort of a neat little trick to give a little bit of a sense of being in a hospital waiting room. So with that said, um, let's look at the characters that we, uh, we put in a story because so much of the story uh, is about them. Uh, they've got nicknames. You see the nicknames in green. Uh, we start with the two siblings, which have already been introduced, Rebecca and Tobias. And I picked names from the Old Testament and that'll become evident toward the end of the story. There were two concierges in the room, the actual room that I was in, uh, but I created one. Her name was Polly, a senior citizen, very uh, motherly, very grandmotherly, trying to help people in the waiting room. And she was assisted by an ex-Marine drill sergeant, Donna May. 
And both of them, Polly and Donna May, their job was to control the room. Uh, the first character after that you meet is a woman, we never get her direct name, but he, she, she's introduced to us in terms of she's yik yakking, she won't stop, she's a jibber jabber, uh, she's touching, touching things constantly. Tobias begins the story by giving people nicknames. He named her Ants in the Pants, and she follows through the waiting room through four hours. The next person we meet is a man who marched face first, obviously he was on his cell phone, into the glass door, into the surgical waiting room, blighted his nose, and he was followed by his Uber driver. Um, Tobias comment, comments on him that he, he's a dumb Yankee. So now you probably know the story set in the South. Uh, then we're introduced to a young couple, both dressed in their pajamas, probably 18 or 19 years old. Uh, they get the nickname, or the woman does, Blanket Girl. She's totally covered under a blanket during the whole time she's there, doesn't even realize her boyfriend who came in with her is out of surgery at a certain point, and he's ready to check out. She's still under a blanket, fubbing, or phoning, sorry. Uh, well, fubbing is a word. Then we have an elderly couple and a granddaughter, the jokester. And the jokester's a guy, sort of senior citizen, just watching everything that goes on. He makes a lot of comments, and his granddaughter chuckles, and she, she just laughs at everything in the room. Uh, she also adds a, a touch of uh, sobriety to the room, uh, comforting patients, or people waiting when she sees they need to be comforted. Uh, there's a family of four that are obsessed with their phones, and all four of them are sitting in chairs identically, elbows on the arms of the chairs, head bent down, looking at their phones. And uh, Tobias nicknamed the headbenders. And they do funny things. They don't just sit there all the time. There's a family of four, and the father uh, snores a lot. Then there's a, a wealthily dressed woman who came in with her mother, and the woman insists on bringing her service dog again. The service dog happens to be an Irish wolfhound, and even the ex-Marine drill sergeant, Donna May, can't handle that situation. And then finally, uh, uh, best of all, I think, is that there's a family of seven, and uh, they're called the Romper Rumors because the five kids literally just romping all over the room with uh, the lead played by a four-year-old, and Buster uh, literally did his darndest to break every element in the room. So the, you've got a surgical waiting room described in detail, and it, the fun of, for me of writing this short story, it was just all character driven and um, dialogue driven. And uh, that's it. So let's look at the end, the surprise ending. Uh, put my glasses on here. For decades, every chair lent comfort to patients, family members, as the hospital saw their health needs. The chairs heard every conversation and cataloged every visitor's feelings. During the past 17 years, the two chairs carried forward this tradition. Chairs Rebecca and Tobias had felt and seen two lifetimes of waiting room stories. Today was another. Thank you for your story, kids. The Rebecca and Tobias were chairs, and they were two of the original chairs who were put into the, that waiting room 17 years previous. And obviously they sat there for 17 years. They felt, as people sat on the chairs, they heard, they heard the stories that happened in the waiting room. And this was one more little short story where Tobias and uh, Rebecca recounted that particular morning's activity. And with that said, thank you very much, Vince. Um, hopefully next week, many of you will come back and look at my first uh, full-length novel called Shattered by Fear. It's a, a paranormal story of a coming of age of, of a young girl who was lost on the mountain and chased by her phobias. And there's a summary of the the two short stories that we've looked at in, in sort of some detail now and uh, shadowed by fear up and coming. And thank you for the time, Vince. Well, thank you, Thomas. This has been you know, really informative. You know, it's just amazing. It, I've watched the, uh, the development of your st short stories uh, as with a beta reader. Uh, I, I found it uh, instructive too that uh, a part of our North Carolina Writers Network group uh, serves as beta readers and one of our group members, fellow author, um, uh, well, I guess I could mention his name, right? Dr. William Cottrell, uh, as a physician, was able to give you some good feedback. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop share so you can talk a little bit, I hope, about uh, the importance of a beta reader and uh, to, the, to the project and to the story development. Yeah, just real quickly, it, it's easy enough for us as an author to sit down and sort of sketch out and outline a story and then put words on paper. And we understand it up here. Uh, that's not what we're writing it. We're writing a story for somebody else to understand or to have enjoyment from uh, what we're reading. 
So Bill Cottrell was my initial beta reader for this particular story. And as a, a formal, former hospital worker in surgery, uh, his comments were just very instructive. And obviously I, I changed a number of ways that I, I approached the activity in that waiting room. And his, his help was just tremendous. It was a second set of eyes. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Well, I thank you so much, Thomas. This, you know, these sessions, I hope are helpful to fellow writers. I hope those writers will think about joining our chapter. Uh, since we meet virtually now, they don't have to live in the greater Charlotte area. They can be anywhere uh, where the, the tube will reach them. Uh, they're certainly welcome to join these lessons learned sessions and perhaps they can contribute uh, to those sessions. Uh, I encourage writers to, uh, to take a look at our website, uh, www.hiddentreasurenovels.com. Uh, we will be hosting these lessons learned on the HTN uh, YouTube playlist and channel. Uh, thanks again, Tom, for uh, all your hard work and for your insights. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing everyone next week, same time, same station, Thursday afternoon. Uh, have a great day, everyone, and a great weekend. Thank you, Vince. Thank you.